Welcome to Rock Creek Insights. Uh, we are very lucky this morning to have two leading economists who happen to be women to discuss the global economy and its challenges after SVB and Credit Suisse. In alphabetical order, we have Carmen Reinhardt, the Minos Zombanakis Professor of the International Financial System at Harvard's Kennedy School, and of course, former World Bank Chief Economist and author of much uh, incredibly important work on the economy. And then Betsy Stevenson, Professor of Public Policy and Economics at the University of Michigan, a former member of President Obama's Council on Economic Advisors and colleague of mine. And I'm Caroline Atkinson, a senior global strategist at Rock Creek and former Deputy National Security Advisor at the White House for International Economics. So I'm going to go straight into it and ask Carmen just to comment. Uh, we've got a whole lot of challenges facing the global economy, but the one that is perhaps most pressing now is what's happening to the banking system. Seems that action over the weekend in Switzerland may have calmed things down at least right now, but maybe uh, at least some people expect that volatility will continue. So I wonder how serious you think the banking crises and turmoil of the past two, two to three weeks uh, has been. Well, Caroline, uh, thank you, first of all, for, for having me in this uh, session. And, and uh, you know, um, I think you've already highlighted the challenges in the last, uh, uh, really the last couple of weeks. <laughs> we, the initial conditions are important to remember. We already had went into this with considerable challenges. I mean, even before the breakout of this uh, new wave of, of, of instability, uh, you know, there were concerns, A, about uh, whether the major central banks would be able to tame inflation. That's an issue that's alive and well, and B, whether the global economy in different speeds was slipping into recession. So that's sort of the setting for, for the turmoil. And, and I think that's important because, you know, this occurring at already uh, a, a weaker entry point, if you will, it, it of course uh, has the ability to, to you know, uh, pivot the balance towards more recessionary uh, outcomes uh, than, than, than we had even a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, I mean, just by the definition of banking crisis that Kaminsky and Reinhardt and Reinhardt and Rogoff have been using for, for decades, this clocks in as a banking crisis, right? It's not yet in the United States a systemic one. It's not a systemic one, but a banking crisis is basically whenever you have, you know, a takeover by an institution, a substantial bailout by, by the central bank and or federal authorities. Those are standard definitions, okay? So it, it, it hits that point of, 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 of being considered a banking crisis, albeit at this stage, at this stage, and we hope it stays this way, uh, a non-systemic one. Um, and, um, you know, I think we are all also waiting. So, so the reason I wanted to pivot back to initial conditions is, you know, I think this has raised questions of whether the actions required or the actions not required, but the actions that the Federal Reserve will undertake uh, are limited to providing liquidity support, which is what central banks are supposed to do, uh, but also will extend to a change in their planned um, disinflation when they meet on Wednesday. I think everybody's waiting with bated breath to see what the outcome uh, will be, whether they indeed do move ahead with a 25 basis point uh, increase in interest rates or as, as the ECB did, uh, 
uh, with, with, you know, or whether it means a change in course. Um, so let me turn to Betsy, if I may, and say, uh, and put that to you. So everybody's wondering what the Fed is going to decide meeting tomorrow and then concluding on Wednesday. They're also going to put out their summary of economic projections, which they do once a quarter, and the so-called dot plot of where they see interest rates going over the next year or two. Uh, how do you think they will react? It's still two days away, which can be a lifetime in, uh, in finance and economics. And how do you think they should react? We've had some strong voices coming out saying they should stick to the path as the ECB did that was expected, um, although most few people are arguing for a 50 basis point rise for the Fed this week. How do you see it? Well, it, it, it does show you how quickly things can move, because if you remember, it was only a few weeks ago that uh, Jay Powell was testifying in front of Congress. And I think um, markets really moved to price in a 50 basis point increase. Um, and I think that's where people thought we were. And then all of a sudden we've got this SV bank collapses. We get this banking crisis on our hands. Um, and I don't think anybody's now talking about that 50 basis point, but they're asking the 25 basis point where the Fed had really provided some good forward guidance that that's where they were going. Should they stick with that or not? And, you know, there are a lot of factors that they're, they're going to be taking into account. I think this is maybe one of the most consequential meetings that they're going to have. Um, one thing is, you know, one of the reactions of this banking crisis is that credit's tightening up. And there are different estimates out there about that tightening of credit. What's that equivalent to in terms of a Fed hike? I think at the low end, I've seen uh, estimates that say, well, roughly it's going to be around 25 basis points. I've sort of seen more people at this is closer to 50 basis points. So you can think in some ways like the banking crisis just hiked rates 50 basis points, then maybe the Fed should pause. And I've seen other estimates that say, actually, when the dust settles, this is going to be more like 150 basis point increase, the equivalent of in terms of the tightening of credit. So I think that's going to be one of the big factors that the Fed is going to be taking into account. You know, the, the truth is very few of us have as much information as people at the Fed currently have about the overall health of the banking system. And so I could come here and tell you what, you know, I think they should do, but what I think they need to do is use their information that I don't have to make the best decision possible. And, uh, you know, th that, uh, you know, that's really going to depend on how many banks they think are insolvent if they were to take a mark to market approach. And we're starting to again, see some estimates of that, but they're going to have better information on that on, I'm going to do the two handed economist thing. You know, on the one hand, I really felt like they should stick with what they promised, which is they're going to go up 25 basis points, because I have all along felt like, actually, we need to get where we're going, and then we just need to hold and let everybody adjust to it. Um, I never thought they should go, you know, prior to the SVB uh, bank, you know, people were, were saying, you know, the Fed needs to hit terminal rates of 6%. I never thought they needed to go that high. I don't think anybody thinks they need to go that high right now. I think nobody hopes that they need to go that high, but they probably are going to ultimately have that 25 basis point hike. So why not do it right now? The flip side to that is maybe they should wait and let the dust settle and figure out whether this credit tightening is a, a 25, 50 or 150 basis point equivalent before they take rates uh, any farther. Right. Okay. Well, I want to turn to Carmen and say, partly, obviously, with your background on or on uh, bank crises and so on, Betsy's laid out, we don't know how much of a tightening is going to come in credit conditions in the US as a result of this, of the SVB and consequent uh, concerns. Is it inevitably going to mean a tightening of conditions? In other words, after the bank, uh, what's happened at SVB, despite the infusion of federal funds and the extension of guarantees, deposit guarantees to all of the depositors in the intervened banks, is there nevertheless going to be inevitably some tightening of credit conditions that takes place? And should that be the sort of justification or the measurement of that should determine what the Fed does? Or should the Fed also think, well, if I make a mistake on inflation, it may be 
smaller or, or, or less small, but if I make a mistake on, on a banking crisis, that's very hard to put back in the bottle. So the, the risks are uh, asymmetric. So over to you, Carmen. So you asked a straightforward question and then a very difficult one. Let me, let me tackle the straightforward one, which is, you know, as Betsy has, has already mentioned, credit crunches are the norm uh, whenever you have banking problems. And this is uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, one of them has to do with uh, a rise in risk aversion. You know, that, that uh, bankers become more risk averse in general. Everyone becomes more risk averse. You tend to flow more towards uh, low risk assets. Um, second, uh, demand for, for uh, loans also tends to weaken as the economy slows. Uh, so uh, tighter credit conditions are, you know, how, whether you call it a full-fledged credit crunch or something else, that depends on the scale, okay? Uh, but the direction is- Is clear. Is clear. The direction is clear. It's a question of how big the order of magnitude would be. Um, on the second part, should the Fed make its policy decisions contingent on what they estimate that the magnitude of the credit crunch may be? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I, you know, um, I think, you know, the they very much have a financial stability mandate right in front of them. And they acted according to that financial, I mean, in the 1913, you know, the, the establish of the Federal Reserve, the, 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 the central bank is to provide an elastic currency in times of stress. They, this is coming out of the 1907 uh, uh, financial right. panic. And we've just had a 19th century panic basically in, 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 in our hands because, you know, the 95% of the uh, uh, SVP B's deposits were uninsured. So this is very old fashioned crisis in that dimension. But getting back to your, your, your question, um, should they predicate their actions on what they expect? I, I think, first of all, there's a huge amount of uncertainty, even with, 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 you know, if you have, re even with, you know, reasonable models. Uh, I mean, it, I, I think, it, all of us, and this is why I had mentioned initial conditions, I'll keep it brief, but, you know, going into this, our star, which was a core model of, of for, you know, the, the Fed thinking had been set aside because of the COVID shocks and, and, and so on. So I, I don't think, uh, I, look, let me conclude by saying in the 1970s, inflation persistence Beside wage price spiral, you know, dimension, besides uh, supply shocks, w it, it importantly owed to the Fed getting cold feet uh, in inflation fighting prematurely. Back then, they would get uh, uh, cold feet because labor markets weakened, unemployment rose, and, and you know, so scaled back. Right. Now, in this case, if they scale back now, it's clearly not because of those considerations, but exclusively uh, uh, of financial stability. But having said that, whether it's the unemployment rate doing it or financial stability doing it, I think scaling back prematurely uh, means that they will have to deal with a bigger problem down the road. Uh, down the road. That's can I, can interesting. I, 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 yes, yes, absolutely. I just wanted to say, Betsy, that um, I have tended to believe and to say repeatedly, and uh, Rock Creek has said, we think that the Fed is very aware of the premature easing in the 1970s. They are determined not to have that happen again. They will not be put off by unemployment going up, a weakening of the labor market. They've actually wanted that. They will not be put off by the stock market falling. They haven't minded that, and to some extent, it uh, it has done some tightening. I've always felt that financial stability, which um, which uh, as the name implies, is uh, is more fragile 
uh, might be something that would give them pause and maybe even appropriately because you don't it starts off a run that or cascade of problems that you don't necessarily uh, anticipate but that may be wrong so I'd love to hear your view on uh, on on what Kahneman says that if they if if the Fed or central banks more generally ease up on the fight against inflation now there'll be bigger problems down the road I think that's what that's what Kahneman said let's hear your view well, I, I wanted to jump in just to say, I, you know, the thing that really um, amazes me is like the moral imperative to save the banking sector is so much stronger than the moral imperative to help the workers. I mean, when you think about the long term consequences, when people lose their jobs, when unemployment rises in communities, we can see generations impacted with negative effects of people becoming disenfranchised from work, disconnected to work. So I just... Let's not understate the consequences of, gee, a whole bunch of people have to lose their job for us to get inflation down. And now everybody's all like, oh, well, we can't have any depositors lose their cash. That would be terrible. Um, look, I, I do think there's something to the fact that we don't want the whole banking system going down like a set of dominoes. Um, so I I agree with that. But I also I agree with Carmen that that they have to keep their eye on the inflation fighting prize um, and not, you know, sort of kowtow to uh, a bunch of particularly high moneyed uh, interests saying like, oh, you have to protect us. Look, the majority of Americans, the majority of their money is FDIC insured. The problem is the select few, right? SV Bank was full of uninsured depositors. That's why it looked like a good old fashioned bank run. Uh, but uh, you know, but but for most Americans, their money's safe, and the problem they're facing is prices are rising. So I do want to see the Fed keep their eye on that price, but I, I'll take a different tact as well and say, I I want to see like Congress needs to join the inflation fighting party. Uh, you know, we always say that well, the central banks in charge of inflation, and that's true. Uh, that we, you know, we, that is their mandate. That's what they're supposed to do. But government fiscal policy can make their lives easier or it can make their lives harder. And so far, mostly Congress and the White House together, the, the full administration has made their life a little bit harder. How are they making it harder? They're threatening to default on the debt. That's not good for banking stability. Um, so that's one way they're making it harder. They also can do things that would immediately achieve some of the Fed's goals, right? We have very tight labor markets, and the concern is that we're trying to hire people that we don't have. You know where to get more people right away? Immigration reform. Get that passed tomorrow, and you'll actually make the Fed's job a little bit easier for them. Do a massive increase in guest worker visas and get a bunch of people in the country. Again, make the Fed's job easier. You know what else they could do? Raise taxes. Oh, that sounds terrible. But if we want to save the banking system, maybe we need to raise taxes so that we're reducing demand, doing some of the Fed's jobs for it. And just to show that I can piss off both political parties, we need to cut spending so that, again, we're reducing demand, doing some of the Fed's job for it. So, you know, I do think that inflation fighting is really important. I would, you know, I think that uh, they need to make it very clear to markets that they're not giving up on that, that they haven't been spooked by banking. But I also think it's time for, uh, and again, this applies outside of the U.S. as well, it's time for, for fiscal policy to join this party. Yeah, that's interesting because we had a whole period after the global financial crisis when uh, you know monetary policy was the only game in town and monetary policy with zero interest rates eventually uh, was the supposed looked to to be the engine of uh, of growth and fiscal policy was rather contractionary in many cases now we've got the inverse with monetary policy cranking up interest rates rising and fiscal policy not particularly helping and maybe a fiscal policy uh, joined in, 
monetary policy, which is a bit of a blunt tool, wouldn't need to be so uh, stretched. And I want to go back to Carmen, and, and you mentioned about it's not just in the US. And of course, you've been an expert on the global economy and emerging markets. And uh, I wouldn't say Switzerland is an emerging market, but at least on, on, on banks more generally. I'd love to hear your view on two things. One, how should emerging markets think about what's going on now and what lessons, if any, are there for their monetary policy and fiscal policy actors? And secondly, uh, I'd be interested in a view on the ECB action last week. Seems to have been OK. There hasn't. I was listening last week to Larry Summers saying, well, the ECB raised by 50 basis points. It didn't cause a problem. Uh, do you think that's right? Or do you think one might look back and think, well, it helped to tip Credit Suisse? No, I think that's Can't right. I, I, I think that's right. I, I, look, uh, um, you know, uh, and I will certainly tackle exactly what you asked, but I do want to make the point that, you know, we look for immediate causes for these crises, but often the root cause of these crises are not immediate. They, they, the problem has been brewing. And let me say, yeah. we have had 15 years of a secular decline in nominal and real interest rates, negative, deeply negative sustained real interest rates, not just in the US, even more so in Europe and Japan. Uh, negative real interest rates are a tax on savers and an inducement to leverage. Uh, they're also an inducement to take on risk, uh, which is exactly what we've seen uh, in those balance sheets. You're willing to take on more risk because you're searching for returns. Uh, and, and, you know, let's not forget that that, that is. But, um, you know, the, I think this, this, this problem is, 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 you know, that, Switzerland is not normally where one looks to when one thinks of banking crisis because they have been a rock of financial stability forever. Uh, but this clocks in as a banking crisis uh, uh, as well. And it will also, given that uh, the scale of it relative to the size of their financial system is bigger, uh, it, 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 I, I'm, I'm not judging prematurely, but, you know, it'll be seen whether it's, it, it's a systemic or a more contained borderline crisis, because it, 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 it has a bigger balance sheet impact in the aggregate than it does in the U US. What does this mean for the rest of the world and especially emerging markets? It's bad news. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's really bad news because, you know, uh, going back to our, our, our discussion, you know, that you know, the, the, the monetary authorities, uh, in my view, very rightly, inflation is an extremely regressive tax, uh, have been raising rates for some time to deal with, with, with a spike in inflation that you have to go back to 40 years. You have to go back to the early 80s to see this kind of inflation in advanced economies. Bad news for emerging markets, I'll conclude by saying, what are the things that drives capital flows out of emerging markets, which, you know, capital flow reversals leaves them in a very vulnerable spot. Uh, it, well, it's rising interest rates at the center, uh, rising risk aversion. You know, you have a flight to safety, you have a flight into treasuries, you have a flight out of, uh, out of EM debt and, and other higher risk. Uh, so now you add the volatility of markets and and you know the literature on capital flows shows also that volatility itself is a big driver out. So they are in in you know a fairly vulnerable position. I think what uh, you know what I think will be uh, critical is is you know that this so far has been an advanced economy problem. Um, 2008, 2009 was an advanced economy problem 
it hit emerging markets in the short run, but they got out of it pretty quickly because it wasn't. This time, the big danger I'll leave you with, and I'll stop here, is that they're in worse shape than they were in 2008, 2009. Because they have a lot of fragilities that have come have been you know brought out by the disastrous last few years um, that you know Which, so, so vulnerable. disaster from the pandemic as well as from inflation. So Betsy, um, I want to go back in a minute to the state of the economy, the initial conditions that Carmen talked about because she was characterizing it or people often characterize it as weak. But at the same time, we know in a sense it was too strong or at least stronger than everybody expected as far as one can trust the data, both in the labor markets in the US at any rate, not only, and in inflation. But before that, there was a question, there has been a question that uh, from one of the audience, which is um, it's ad hominem. So I don't mind if you broaden it out, but it's uh, and it, it incorporates a lot of assumptions about what's the right thing to do. It, the question is, does Jay Powell have the courage of Paul Volcker? And uh, perhaps you can begin by explaining what the questioner might have in mind and how you think that tracks to today and to what you were saying before about, is it fine to just push unemployment up and what are the relative costs and benefits? So I don't think that there's an equivalence there we need. Um, and, and Carmen, will be able to jump in on this uh, as well, which is, I mean, the way I go back to that period is, you know, there were- In the 1970s. In the 1970s. There were a lot of things that were really unique about that period. Um, One is like the entrenched wage price spirals that occurred because a lot of people were covered under um, uh, bargaining agreements that meant that it was just wage increases got locked into contracts which led to price increases in a way that was a really hard problem to to break. We also had this problem of inflation's coming up and then the central bank's getting a lot of pressure from politicians, the president to say, hey, we can't have a recession. You gotta have, you gotta ease things up on me. And I think there was a belief at the time in monetary policy that maybe the Fed doesn't have to be as as hard hitting if the problem is supply driven, right? And that was like, you know, the oil crisis spurred a lot of it. And I think there was a lot of ambiguity around, do we do we take the same set of actions? Do we need to be as tough when there's an oil, when there's a supply side crisis, like an oil crisis? I think today everybody thinks, doesn't matter what's causing the inflation, the Fed needs to fight it. It doesn't matter whether it's supply side or demand side. So you'll hear a lot of economists fighting over Was this a supply-driven inflation or demand-driven inflation? And the answer is, doesn't matter. Fed still needs to fight it. Um, And that, I think, is a a different mindset. I think all of those mindsets meant that when Volcker came in, everybody had sort of gotten it in their head that high inflation was going to stick around. And so Volcker had to bring down the hammer and say, no, it's not. And then how does he convince people? Well, he convinces people by just show credibly showing that he's going to allow an enormous amount of pain and he's still going to be bringing the hammer and so what your questioner is implying is like will jay powell be able to withstand the pain and i think there though we have to ask the question is do we need as much pain now as as we did then and i so so i don't think it's just will he be willing to do it do we really need that um and i i tend to think we don't need to see massive unemployment um, the way that this, uh, look, there, there are obviously models that show sort of in, you know, lockstep, if we lay 5 million people off, well, that's 5 million people who can't buy stuff anymore. Great. So that we brought down demand and that's a 5 million people reserve army. That means that employers will find it easier to find people. They'll be able to pay them lower wages. That'll take off the wage, uh, pressure. So, I mean, in some sense, mechanically, of course, that's true, but we don't have to do it that way, right? We could bring in more workers, right? And then bring in more, uh, you know, expand the workforce. That's going to have, that's not going to have the demand side effect, but it's certainly going to mean that we have the labor supply to meet what employers are demanding. Um, 
So I think that there are tools that we have in ways to approach inflation that doesn't mean we just have to bring the pain and sit through the pain. So in that sense of the question, I, I disagree that we need to do that. There's another part of the question, which is, right, obviously they're going through a tough time right now. It's a banking crisis. Will, will he chicken out and run the other way and loosen monetary policy and r lower rates? Lots of people are saying, don't do that. What are they going to do? Um, and I, that's where, you know, they are going to have to be remain committed to bringing inflation down. I personally think that cutting rates is somewhat counterproductive because if you cut rates, then I think most people will start to think that inflation isn't going to come down. That will change inflation expectations. That will lead people to expect higher inflation in the long run. And guess what? Even without raising rates, that's going to lower the value of a 30 year bond today because all of a sudden you think the money you're going to get for it in 30 years is going to be able to buy a lot fewer things. So, and that may push rates up. Yeah. So I, I think it's counterproductive. So I, I think that that's, it's a different kind of, of pain that they're facing right now. It's a different kind of pressure that they're facing right now. And I think it's more around, will they be able to withstand the pressure from people who are quite influential and tend to have very short term interests at the top of their head? Right. Well, I want to switch to, to Carmen for any comment on the courage point, but, but feel fine. It's fine if you don't have that, but also to ask about this issue of which tools should the central bank be using for what? So if we think that, the interest rate is the appropriate tool to keep on uh, using to fight inflation. And as Betsy says, there are other things one could do. Lifting tariffs is another one that is not politically very popular, but would also obviously help uh, to reduce um, inflationary pressures. Uh, but are there different tools, therefore, that the Fed should be thinking about, or not just the Fed, the regulators, to support the banking system if they're worried about the size and the potential spillover and contagion from a credit crunch. Uh, and obviously the one that a lot of people are talking about at the moment is uh, extending deposit uh, insurance guarantees and to uh, deposits of more than 250,000. Now that helps by definition people or maybe small businesses, but people who have more cash in the bank than your average of American or the most Americans? Is that good, bad, indifferent? Is that a way to think about it and disconnect it from the interest rate argument? So over to you, Carmen. So on the first part on the courage question, which is a, um, a very interesting question because it's not just about courage. And I think Betsy has alluded to a number of the things I, I would have liked to have highlighted. But, you know, in terms of what would be required? Well, let's not forget that when Volcker started to tighten, inflation was 13% and had been around for some time so that inflation expectations were pretty unanchored. Mm -hmm. uh, and things had started to, to really, indexation had taken off. So it was, a, it, you know, we're, we're not talking about requiring the same things. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I, I, I am not, uh, you know, um, but, but I, again, this goes back to something Betsy says that um, the trade-offs have shifted. You know, back then the, the, the trade-off really was the classic inflation unemployment trade-off. Now, I think the, the, question or the challenge, the, the, the thing that will really, I think, I, I mean, I'm sure the poor man has many things to lose sleep over, but that will make Powell lose sleep is, is the issue of financial stability. And we really are living in a world of financial dominance, big time. You know, when Paul Volcker tightened in October of 79, um, household debt in the United States was about half of what it is today. Mm -hmm. Public sector debt was about a quarter of what it is today. 
So the concerns of, and, and that makes a huge difference, right? Because raising rates when nobody has leverage has very different real consequences too, in terms of also financial fragility than when you're, so that I think, um, it, it connects to your second question is that that here what will require, I think it will be very difficult, if not outright impossible for, for Chairman Powell to make an argument for, uh, you know, slowing the pace, the, you know, de deviating from the announced or pre-announced plan mm -hmm. for inflation fighting on the basis of 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 the labor market, it's 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 really hard. Uh, it's not hard at all to make the case if you wanted to push it on financial stability. I think that would be wrong. Um, I think if you look at and this goes to your question on instruments, if you look at the Fed balance sheet, they've already whatever QT was being done has already been reversed. Right, yeah. because we've had a surge in borrowing at the discount window. We've had, this this has real mm -hmm. consequences. The balance sheet of the Fed has once again expanded uh, abruptly. So we've already been dealing with the liquidity provision and the bailout dimension mm -hmm. uh, through uh, the elastic provision of of currency. You know, along the mandates of of of, of the Fed and its its original you know founding intentions uh founding mandate uh, to bring in the macro to to have the macro objectives subservient to that i i think it's really problematic i think there's a separation uh and that interest rate policy uh which also i think is is as betsy was mentioning an important signaling for forming expectations uh it you know that that be maintained uh that that does not become subservient uh to to the to the uh dealing with with the fallout um and, and we can deal with the fallout or the fed can and the authorities more generally should deal with the fallout with specific banking measures whether it's ensuring more deposits or providing more liquidity you would see that uh, those as the instruments i, I for... think I, I i'm less conflicting on providing liquidity than i am on the insurance the, the problem with insurance it is there de facto you know uh, it's not the, i'm sorry the jury is not there de facto it's definitely there right. that, it, 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 if you know it, policymakers can turn blue in the face saying you're not insured you're not insured but the bet has has been the other way right i mean the bet has been that we have a tendency to deal with crises uh through bailouts sure uh and and so you know um but we could be getting the worst of all worlds now if in practice we would bail out or the the oh it has a, it has a moral hazard it has a moral hazard problem that can't be uh ignored uh i mean we we do have i mean i i don't think depositors really are that discriminating you know that they're right. going to enforce market discipline but bankers can't can and do act more reckless yeah. Uh, yeah. If 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 there's this blanket uh, security on on their deposit base, unless they're pushed maybe to increase capital. So I want to cut, touch quickly on two more issues um, before we uh, move to a discussion about women in the workforce. And the first one is you had mentioned about uh, the state of the labor market, and that's not anything that it's been consistently looking strong on the macro data. Although just again this morning, we heard about layoffs in the tech sector from Amazon. We've heard of a whole string of layoffs in that sector, which is obviously the one that was um, troubling for SVB, I mean, the tech sector. So Betsy, uh, you know, you've done a lot of work on labor markets and so on. How do you see, are we in a tight labor market? Are we not in a tight labor market? Can it change very quickly? 
Um, you know, I, I think that we are uh, clearly in a tight labor market. Um, we've been really fortunate to see labor supply expand enough that employers can continue to hire at, you know, really record numbers. You know, we've seen, uh, you know, over the last several months, over 300,000 people uh, additionally hired each month. That's expansionary hiring. That's not stable, neutral hiring. That's, that is growth. And I think, uh, you know, the, the question is, that's fine as long as there are the workers there and we don't start all competing over a sort of a fixed pool of workers. And that's the, you know, the concern about the unemployment rate being, you know, quote, too low, that I think real people get frustrated at hearing the idea that we need to keep people unemployed. But what they basically mean is it's just really hard for you to find someone to hire. So you have to substitute wage gains for search. Uh, and that starts to drive up um, inflation. But, you know, we, we pay a lot of attention to these stories about people getting laid off in the tech sector. And I think that's because the tech sector, you know, really, uh, you know, exists in a magical place in our mind where we think of it as this, you know, just, um, you know, uh, it's just sort of full of magical thinking, like anything's possible. That Lee is in Silicon Valley full of having worked there. <laughs> yeah, it's just it, anything's possible. Everything's, you know, great and we're different and we're, and, you know, what happened in the tech sector was they got this enormous wind at their back helping them with the pandemic because it forced adoption of a lot of new technologies really rapidly. You take people like my parents in their 70s and all of a sudden they had to learn how to use Zoom so they could just keep in touch with their grandkids. And they had to do all this online shopping that they'd never done before. And they had to figure out new platforms. And we've got people like that all over the world who it might have taken them 10 years to learn all that new technology and they were forced to do it in a year. So that led to a surge of adoptions. The thing that blows my mind is that a lot of companies thought that was going to go on forever, right? We all owned as, you know, subscribed to as many streaming services as we will ever in our life in 2021, 2020. And we're never going to want to go back to having that many streaming services. So you can't keep up Netflix you know, can't keep growing its subscriber base at the kind of rates it did in 2020 and 2021. The same thing's true for Amazon. The same thing's true for Facebook. And yet their magical thinking deluded themselves into thinking they were on some new growth path and they hired for that and they planned to keep hiring like that. And now they've been brought down to earth. Guess what? They still come out way, way ahead in the pandemic, but they're not in some you know new magical land they're now going to have to go back to slower adoption rates because they pulled forward a lot of new customer growth and that's going to mean they should expect even with no recession slower growth over the next few years that's what happens when you eat your future growth early there's not as much to eat later right but you your point is despite all those headlines the last macro data we had pre-banking crisis what showed strong labor markets now we also know that labor is a is a lagging indicator and so you can start off having a, a tightening of credit and lending conditions and then companies pulling back and then eventually that will show up in the in the labor statistics so i do think these things these times are a little bit different now and you're right i should have said and also keep in mind the tech sector is like one percent of employment so one percent of employment is getting you know a little bit hammered and it's not showing up in the aggregate data at all even if i look at a broad category like overall hiring in the tech sector you barely see uh any declines you see sort of a flattening so you know what's really happening in the labor market leisure and hospitality is just chugging along it's still at levels of employment that are well below where they were uh prior to the pandemic and they look like we're still they're, they're at levels that would be consistent with a recession. So I think even if we went into a recession, you wouldn't see a lot of layoffs in leisure and hospitality because they've struggled to come back. They've struggled to come where they are. And if they see declines in demand, I think they'll be able to manage it without losing a lot of people. Same thing if you turn to education and health services, they have recovered. 
the employment they were at prior to the pandemic, but not where you would have expected them to be without the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic hammered hiring in the in health and private education, and that sector is still struggling to hire people. Uh, it's still sort of struggling to figure out what its new normal is going to be. I think mm -hmm. we're going to continue to see hiring there regardless of what happens with all of this stuff. But we are going to see declines in the goods service in, in goods. And so my last thing I'll just say is like, look, we've just seen massive sectoral shifts. We saw the whole, we saw people shift massively from services towards goods at the beginning of the pandemic. We're now in the middle of that shift back. Uh, there's some turmoil that's going on there as we shift. And I think that's the thing we're going to have to all be cautious about as we interpret the data around employment uh, and uh, a volatility because some of this is adjustment back to what will be our, our true normal post-pandemic. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it almost sounded as if you hadn't given up on the idea of a soft landing. Soft in the sense that you could address that inflation might come down, we're not in a wage price spiral, there, there is still a scope for uh, a cooling of demand that maybe addresses inflation, but does not lead to a lot of increase in unemployment, which, which I would call a, a softish landing. Although we have this wild card of banking. Yes, I I was definitely team soft landing until this wild card got uh, dealt to me and to the globe. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking it's still not a soft landing is not off the table. You know, one of the things that can happen with a banking crisis is it can spook people. Everybody's going to get more risk averse, as Carmen's already told us. If you're risk averse, what should you do? Don't quit your job. Uh, if you're risk averse, what should you do? You should cut back your spending a little bit. What else should you do? Maybe now's a good time to look for a job. You've been dragging your feet about going back to work. Let's get yourself in the labor market because things could be a little crazy. You have all those things happen and they're all going to be supporting a soft landing. Right, Carmen, I want to get your take on that. And also just a question from somebody in the audience, which uh, address if you feel like it, but you raised the question of, well, the QT that the Fed was doing has more or less been unwound by the extraordinary liquidity measures in the last uh, 10 days. Uh, somebody is saying, isn't there a different, isn't that a sort of temporary phenomenon, whereas QE originally was a more permanent move? So is it equivalent to a buying rather than renting if firms are taking on financial institutions, are taking on uh, liquidity from the Fed, but just on a temporary basis? So I don't know if you think there's, that's a realistic or, or an important distinction. No, it is an important so. distinction, and we hope it is a temporary. Um, you know, I mean, th that is the hope, right? That, that the dislocations are, 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 are transitory, the liquidity needs, you know, are, are and, and therefore, you know, a discount window uh, is appropriate. And so, uh, but the point I was making that if you're looking for a reversal, on policy, on the on the QT dimension, the 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 scope of the lending uh, has been such that that's that's already that's already happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we certainly agree that 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 uh, uh, this you know would would be uh, a temporary provision of of of, of liquidity um, on the soft landing. Uh, I think I, I, I'm less convinced than, than um, Betsy. I think let's also define soft landing. If we're going to define it by the labor market, we're going to define it by GDP. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, typically also one thinks of soft landings as, you know, the NBR definition of a recession, you know, declines in GDP. Uh, I think I am very ready to to accept that the consequences for the labor market may be milder uh, and indeed are looking milder. But, you know, in terms of soft landing, not meaning that 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 you will have to see some element of of GDP uh, reflecting uh, the tighter conditions, I I. I still expect that. I mean, I understand that we are in a very exceptional 
situation uh, post COVID, but if you look for at, at cycles of Fed tightening historically, mm -hmm. uh, we had only one soft landing. Uh, historically, that was in 1994. The 94 tightening did not lead uh, to a recession, but it, it was comparatively mild one. Uh, you know, I mean, inflation was three. Tightening was mild. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. tightening was mild. So it was, it was, uh, and and I, I, I think that while indeed the consequences for labor markets will be more limited than in the uh, past, I think we will still see uh, you know, traditional uh, recession type uh, scenario um, because it's also, and I'll conclude with this, remember the, 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 there's a cross section, cross, cross boundary feeding itself as well. Uh, it's not just the US, Europe is, is slowing yeah. even more. Uh, yeah. Emerging markets are also slowing. So you, you really do, you know, uh, have other forces at well uh, pulling it in that direction. Maybe China. But uh, I, I'd like to switch gears a little bit now and just go to Betsy. We are in the middle of or coming to the end of International Women's Month. And uh, the most recent couple of things that I've read about uh, women were rather depressing, especially in the United States with uh, high uh, maternal mortality and um, and still problems in uh, possibly problems post COVID in, uh, in women getting back into the labor force in the numbers that they were before. But I'd be interested in your view, uh, Betsy, also as a researcher on a number of these uh, issues. So, I mean, there's always going to be a glass half full half and a glass half empty story to tell. Um, you know, I, I tend to focus on the, the half full because there's a lot of positive things that have happened. Okay. Um, women got hit much harder in terms of jobs with the pandemic. And that's because this women are more likely to work in the service sector. You know, if you take education and health services, 77 percent of the jobs are held by women. It's been the fastest growing sector for uh, the 21st century and probably even before that. Uh, we didn't see any job loss there in the 2008 recession to tell you just how strong that upward job growth has been. And it explained the majority of the job growth we had between 2015 and 2019. So it's a big sector, it's growing a lot and it mostly employs women and it lost jobs in the pandemic um, and it's been slow to recover them. What have we seen instead? We've seen women actually enter male dominated jobs. Women have gotten uh, you know three or four times or I should say, women are only like 17% of construction jobs, but today women are at, you know, I have 11% more construction jobs than they had prior to the pandemic, whereas men have 2% more construction jobs. Wow. Now, it's a lot more men got jobs in construction than women, don't get me wrong, because at 18%, you're going to really have to uh, move it. But I, what we see is that that's really true across the board in these male dominated occupations. We've seen uh, women grain, gain shares. Why? Because their traditional occupations, their traditional industries, I should say, uh, weren't hiring um, and weren't hiring as quickly. We, we didn't see women come the traditional back. industries that employ women. So they yeah. were going to traditionally male industries yeah. when they couldn't get their jobs in traditionally female jobs they looked at the male jobs and this is what we've seen right. if you look over the last you know 20 years what we've seen is women respond to market forces more than men uh, returns to college education went up women uh increased their college going behavior men did not um women uh you know the economy's gotten stronger and women have come back Traditionally, when men lose their job after a recession, it's very hard to get them back into the labor force. Women are more, uh, uh, they have a wider sense of what kind of job they could take. So when men tend to lose their jobs in manufacturing, they think, if I can't find a manufacturing job, I guess I can't work. When women lose their job in you know, uh, the service sector, they think maybe I should try warehousing. So uh, like those are all the, the things that I think are really optimistic. I mean, there are, 
obviously real challenges. Uh, we're far from achieving gender equity in either the workplace or the home or hospitals, as you mentioned with maternal mortality. Yeah. Um, so the, the levels are bad. Given that it's 2023, I would say clearly the levels are bad, but the direction still remains right. And I you know, remain optimistic that we'll continue to see improvements. And, and frankly, I think one of the reasons why we won't need uh, the labor market to get hammered in 2023, 2024, in order to, for the Fed to bring down inflation is because I think women are more responsive overall to, uh, you know, to coming into the labor force, to taking jobs as employers demand them. And so I think they are our lifeline. Um, and the faster governments and employers realize that, the better off we'll be. Fantastic. Well, I love that up note. And Carmen, may I turn to you just to say, uh, of course, that's not been your area of study, but you are a woman in a male dominated field and you're a woman who's been successful in macroeconomics and finance in the World Bank. And uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that your trajectory and the trajectory that you would hold out for the economy and for other uh, young women as they're considering their future? Well, before I speak to, to my own trajectory, I, I, I'd like to highlight, make a couple of observations. Um, Betsy's already mentioned some of this about women being hit. I mean, when I was, I remember I came out of the bank fairly recently. And yeah, so the World, um, Bank. Uh, the World Bank. And so uh, a, a lot of, and 2020 marked the first year where global poverty increased since 1998. And a lot of the new poor were urban women. And many of those, and this, I'm talking now globally. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so, so the the pandemic i think has has hit women uh particularly hard and another disturbing feature and again you know i'm giving the the half empty and and I, while agreeing with everything on the uh, improvements over time but is that for example uh in many countries as children were being pulled out of school it was found that there incidence of boys returning to school was higher than the incidence of girls oh. returning to school. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, that, which definitely has medium implications for, for human capital and, 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 you know, as those girls reach the, the, the labor force. Um, so, so that, that, that those are pockets of, of, of newer concerns in, in the context of the COVID shock. Um, on my own experience, uh, well, you know, um, I, I think I, 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 I've seen, you know, uh, over the decades, uh, you know, significant improvement in representation of women in finance. My first job before I was an academic, before I was at the IMF was in Wall Street. Um, and, you know, uh, women were very few and far between in those days, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, women in finance and, and within the economics profession, finance is pretty abysmal, okay? It, 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 it's pretty abysmal. If you look at, you know, the, the stats, uh, I think apart from sports and economics, it, it finance is one of the worst areas in terms of representation. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the trend is positive. However, I, I would have hoped the slope had been steeper um also you know uh in terms of uh women entering the the economics profession i you know that that uh that the slope you know would have been uh steeper um i think we've also seen you know big uh um important um um you know female head of treasury, 
<laughs> same woman, female <laughs> head of the Fed. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, uh, women in charge of 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 IMF, the World Bank, the ECB. That that that's that has big demonstration effects, I think. Yeah. For, so so uh, it, it definitely, I wanted to highlight that positive uh, that I you know in in finance, where I still see. Um, really s strong underrepresentation of women, and I wonder if it says something about risk-taking behavior. But um, I talk to a lot of financial institutions all the time. I mean, I, I and 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 uh, where women are the most underrepresented are say in the hedge funds and the high risk takers. Um, so so uh, anyway, that's a little tour, but I think it's very important also not only to highlight that big positions, visible positions and uh, positions of influence have been achieved, but also that COVID has created a lot of new problems. A lot of problems, yes. Well, look, thank you so much, both of you, to professors Common Reinhardt and uh, Betsy Stevenson. A terrific debate. What we could go on uh, on these topics, especially uh, the issue of the last one and some of the points that you both raised. But thank you so much for your time and comments and uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.